Good morning. It is good to be here today. I am um, so thankful for our church body and just want to welcome you, welcome you guys online. Um, look forward to worshiping today with you. I've been talking with um, some of the teachers uh, this morning with Bridge Kids and just reminded of um, just reminded of the good support that we have here that are helping the kids learn and um, learn about God and love and grow to know Him. Um, this morning in Bridge Kids, they're studying in Joshua, and they're um, being taught and encouraged to remember God's might and demonstrate godly fear by obeying Him. And it's amazing to me as I prepare, you know, I prepare the little craft, I cut things out and glue them together. And as I do every week, I'm deeply convicted. And I'm like, man, if I'm the only one that's getting anything out of these kids' lessons, like, it's worth it. <laughs> um, but I just want to encourage you to remember the kids and pray for them. And uh, maybe even encourage yourself to remind yourself that we need to remember what God's done for us and cause that to spur us on to obedience, you know, when, we, when, we're, when it's hard. So um, I also want to remind you, there's a sign-up sheet. I'm going to leave it back on the Welcome Center. Sign up for your trunk. Like, bring your trunk. Get a couple friends to do it together. Like, it will be fun to host this for a trunk or treat for the kids. Um, be a good opportunity to meet some, some young couples um, with little kids and uh, just have a good night together. That's on the 29th of October, and it's just for two hours from 5.30 to 7.30. So um, just stand with me real quick, and let's pray as we get um, into our worship this morning. Lord, I thank you so much for the body of Christ. I thank you that you use our hands and our feet for your, for your business, Lord. I thank you for loving us regardless of who we are and where we've been. And I thank you for the blood of Christ that covers us and for the um, freedom and the forgiveness we find in you. I just pray that you would encourage our hearts today as we come before you and we worship you. We love you, Jesus, in your name. above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice, sing the mercies of our King with trembling. Rejoice, we are children of the promise, the beloved of the Lord, one with everlasting kindness, but with sacrificial blood, bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of a father. I will never let them go. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice, sing the mercies of your King and with trembling rejoice. All our sadness, all our sorrows, Jesus carried up the hill. He has walked the path before us. He is walking with us still. Turning tragedy to triumph. Turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle. So take heart and stand amazed. Rejoice. Come and lift your hand and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice, sing the mercy of your King, and with trembling rejoice. When you cry 
cry to him, he hears your voice. He will wipe away your tears, rejoice. In the midst of suffering, he will help you sing, rejoice. Come and lift your hands and raise your voice. Worthy of all praise, rejoice. Sing the mercy of your King and with trembling rejoice. So I don't know how you guys are walking in this morning. But I want to read a passage before we get to our next song. So this is Psalms 42 and Psalms 121. Because maybe your week this week has felt like a deer running for its life and you are panting, longing for a drink of water. So as the deer pants for those flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When shall I appear before him? My tears have been my food day and night. Well, they say to me all day long, where is your God? But I remember when I used to go into the throng and lead the procession of worship in the house of God. With glad shouts and songs of praise and multitude keeping the festival. Why, O oh soul, are you downcast? Why are you so turmoiled within me? Hope in God. For I shall again see him, my salvation, my Lord. My soul is downcast within me. But I say to God, my rock, where, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you, oh, cast down, oh, my soul? Why is there so much turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I, again, shall sing praise to him. Because I will lift my eyes up to the hills. For where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. <clears throat> never asked these questions, never felt so broken, oh God, what do I do now? Never seen could this way, never seen such pain, oh God, what do I do now? But even here, even now, I lift my eyes to heaven and remember I am loved. I lift these weary hands and let my Father pick me up. More than answers, more than healing, God, your presence is enough. I lift my eyes to heaven and remember you're still where my help comes from. All my fears came true, they're no match for you, oh God, come and help me now. Sense of peace, 
share my suffering oh God come and help me now I lift my eyes to heaven and remember I am loved I lift these weary hands and let my father pick me up more than answers more than healing God your presence is enough I lift my eyes to heaven and Remember you're still where my help comes from And if you're near to the broken hearted You are here with me You take my sorrow inside your hands You turn it to victory And if you're near to the broken hearted You are here with me Take my sorrow inside your hands, turn it to victory. Never asked these questions, never felt so broken, oh God, what do I do now? I lift my eyes to heaven and remember I am loved. I lift my weary hands and let my Father pick me up. More than answers, more than healing, God, your presence is enough. I lift my eyes to heaven and remember you're still where my help comes from. You're still where my help comes from. You're still where my help comes from Please go ahead and be seated. So we have just a couple things we want to announce. Um, did Scott and Denise Carroll make it in today? I didn't see them earlier. So uh, let me give some promo on their behalf. That inspired exhibit and the information's been in the bulletin and the e-letter for about three weeks. That will be well worth your time. If you've been here for any period of time, you know that about once a year or so we uh, invite Scott to do some part of a presentation up here where he brings just a small sampling of the artifacts that will be at the display. And it's just been a powerful thing. I, I still have these great memories of unrolling the Torah scroll through the whole part of the auditorium when the older bridge kids come in and just get to hold in their hands one of the manifestations of God's promise to preserve his word to all generations. So uh, I just felt like I wanted to give a little bit of an attaboy, a plug to that. So if you have a uh, need for more information, you're certainly welcome to see me. And uh, there's good information on their website as well. But the inspired exhibit will be well worth your time. And uh, just want to encourage you to consider attending and invite others as well. And then the other announcement this morning is my wife, Marcia, is going to talk about her women's Bible study beginning this evening. No, next week. <laughs> That's why she makes the announcement. So there's an opportunity for women if they would like to do a little <clears throat> digging, a little deeper study. Um, we are going to start one next week, Sunday night, here at the South Campus at 6 o'clock. Um, can plan on about an hour and a half, and it's going to be called The Power of God's Names. Um, it, I've, it's come to me with high recommendations. I have not done this study before, so I'll be doing it along with you, but it's um, led by Tony Evans, and if any of you have ever heard him preach on the radio or whatever, he is fiery. Um, I've been able to hear him in person at the Moody um, Conference a few times through the years. So The Power of God's Names, there's a workbook that I would need to get ordered for you. I have some. If I run out of those, I may tell you the link and let you order it, or it might be easier actually if I order it because I ordered the wrong ones first. It's, there's a lot out there to choose from. And um, so there's a workbook and we also spend time praying for each other. And if you have felt not as connected as you would like to be, this is a good way to get to know some women here at the church. And we um, support each other. We really get close. It's a six-week study. Um, at this point, we're going to do it once every week. 
as we get into it, if there's a week we need to take off, we'll talk about that. But for the most part, six weeks straight through. So hope to see you catch me afterwards if you'd like me to reserve a book for you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Why don't you guys stand back up with us as we continue to worship our Lord and Savior. One day, every knee is going to bow. One day, every knee, tongue is going to confess that Christ is Lord, that he is the Son of God, that he did die on the cross, that he did do everything needed for past, present, and future for sin to be erased. The question is, can we praise that right now in our hearts, or is it going to be too late for us to make that decision?
pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only you great are you lord great are you
I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King. It makes my heart I am loved by the King Makes my heart I am loved by the King Makes my heart Want you to sing How can I keep keep from shouting your name. I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that our strength, our will, our desire, our hope, our confidence, our surety, is not found in anything outside of you. That there is nothing on this earth that can satisfy. There is nothing on this earth that can bring hope. There is nothing on this earth that can ever sustain us in anything. So may we turn our eyes back to you one more time and hear from you this morning. We love you. In your name, amen. This is, the, uh, this is the time in our service where we take a minute to turn to God's Word. Jake earlier quoted a couple of psalms that are 4,000 years old. I'm going to have you turn to the book of Hebrews, which is about 2,000 years old. How odd is that? Where is that happening any, else, any place else in the planet? where a group of people meet together to study a document so old. Think about that. Think about where we're at in regard to church and what we're doing. I'd like you to turn to the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter 13 today. But think just a little bit about this whole thought process. What does the world think about what we do in this building? I'm sure they, they know we sing. There's kind of this thing about singing. People know about singing. And I know they know something about the Bible. I think it was uh, last week, um, Scott said, I was shocked by what he said, that 70, over 70% of the people do not think that God's Word is God's Word. The Bible is not God's Word. Think about that. You are here today, I would assume most of you, and when we get to this part, you're pretty comfortable opening up God's Word and ready for some authoritative passage of scripture. I spoke uh, Friday in Indianapolis. I can't think there was anybody sitting there waiting for me to speak some authoritative word from the Bible. Uh, they don't know I gave them a couple things, but only a couple people caught it. Uh, when I get up to talk, I'm the authority in the room. How great is that? Whatever I say gets to be the authority for that moment in time. That's sick, to be honest with you. The beauty of what you and I are doing it really comes from a historical place that we're actually here. I love our church and the age groups that we have here. I love that you had kids up here today, present company included, Daniel and Jake. I love, I love seeing our kids. I love the, the, the young adults in our church. I'm old. I'm about ready to be done with everything in life. It won't be long before God takes me home in some form or fashion. I love the fact that this church has a group of people anxious to do what we're doing right now. Um, I, I want to talk about some characteristics of the early church before we jump into the, uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 13. 
there's, there's, there's all kinds of characteristics about church. I'm going to pick five. I actually want to do six, but I'll do the sixth one next week. There's five characteristics I want you to think about about this church thing. The first thing I want us to look at is that when Christ died on the cross and the church began at Pentecost, it became instantly Christ-centered and focused. We're going to see that today. We're going to see it from a book that was written a generation later about what this is about, what you and I are about. We sang songs today that were Christ-centered and focused. We didn't sing things that were not. In fact, in this church, I know that if you were to sing things here that were not, you'd have about seven, eight people come up and challenge you doctrinally. We do that anyhow. So just think about that. Christ-centered and focused. Two, it was spirit-powered and guided. The, the presence of the Holy Spirit gave birth to the church. This is huge. There is no other religion who has a Christ-centered approach where the, the God of the universe sent his son to die and then provided the, the, a person of the Trinity to live with inside of us and empower us. There is no other group that does this, that says you and I are worshiping Christ who died for us and we have the Spirit of God empowering us and living in us. That is just amazing. Nobody else does that. At least that's what... We, when we look at their work, we don't see that. This is really interesting, and I'm going to show you this in just a moment. There was immediate suffering, and it was severe. Immediate. From the very day the first message was preached, suffering was introduced from the world around them. Something happened. Something amazing happened. The Spirit of God came down and filled these people, and the first thing people said about them is, you're a bunch of drunks. Now that, today, would probably be a compliment, but that was supposed to be an insult. The very first thing that happened as a result of the birth of the church was suffering. And then something amazing happened. In the midst of that suffering, people became super unified. In fact, division was so rare in the very beginning. To see it, they, there, there are spots in the book of Acts that they show just small little divisions that someone addressed right away. They were supportive of each other in a sacrificial way. This is really amazing. They were not marketed to. They didn't come together to worship because it made them feel good. They come to worship together because they wanted to worship Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit and then meet each other's needs. It's an amazing thing. The last thing I want to add here, and I'll show you this in a moment, there was an incredible, awesome fear that they had that was coming from the outside, but that was also produced in them. And Jake, you just led us in a beautiful song this morning, Trembling, Rejoicing. Tremble and rejoice. I don't remember the exact lyrics. I'm trying to get better at that. I was going to take a picture of it, and I you keep switching the sides and singing, I can't get it. But it, I, I thought it was beautiful. It was like perfect, because that's exactly what, what it is. So I want you to look at this, and what I want you to understand is this. At that moment in time in history, a group of people, and it started with 11 disciples and a few others, probably 60 to 70 in, 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 nature, in, in, in count, that were meeting together in this place, their complete worldview was changed. They no longer looked at anything like they looked at it before. And so I want to challenge you this morning, and I want to ask you this question. What is your worldview that affects how you live in this world? Hebrews tells us that our job here this morning is to stir you up into good works. That's what I'm hoping we can do today. When you go to, to, to work tomorrow or to school tomorrow or to whatever you're at tomorrow, whatever your appointment is, what's going to happen? I don't want you to think of what we're about to talk about is here. I want you to think of talk about is when we leave this building, what does your worldview look like? Is it radical to the point that the world looks at you and he, they look at me and go, this is just strange? Because that's what was happening in the early church. Let me show you just a couple of things. This was the first sermon at the end of Peter's first sermon. This is what happened in Acts 2, 40 and 41. After many people said to him, what shall we do? 
and he said, save yourself from this crooked generation. <laughs> and those who received the word were baptized. And that day, 3,000 people came to Christ. Okay, that can't happen today. We don't have 3,000 people here. That means if 3,000 people came, how many people were standing there when this happened? Remember, this is in Jerusalem during a celebration, and many Jews were there, but there were people from all different nations, if you read the whole passage. This is amazing. 3,000 people. What would happen if one came to Christ for us today? What would that look like? This is a radical change. This is not a few people. In fact, if you read the rest of Acts 3 and 4, it's really kind of amazing what's happening there. This is a, ma a major growth instantly. And then this is what happens. This is really cool. It says they were devoting themselves to teaching and fellowship and breaking bread in prayer, and awe came upon every soul. I love the word awe. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as anybody had need. I need somebody's car keys. Dan, give me your car keys. This is going to be classic. What kind of car is this? Chevy Traverse. Oh, I should have picked somebody better. <laughs> Dan, you're a Dan. He's a Dan. Dan's giving you his car. <coughs> Thanks. You're Appreciate it. I'll give you a ride home. <laughs> well, Amy, I'll give you a ride home. Is that not wonderful? Dan came here today ready, prepared to give of his belongings, because it's not his, to a man who has a need. Do you have a need for a car? Always. Always. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that. This is a completely radical change in worldview, is it not? We don't have anything like that. Give me the keys back. Seriously, Amy's really worried about this. <laughs> Plus, he's like a Chevy Traverse, really. Think about this. Think about how this, is, how this must be setting in this early moment in time in history of the church. This is a radical way to live. This is not normal. There is nobody on the planet at this moment who's doing this type of thing. Now watch this. Now the full number of who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that he had anything that belonged to him was his own, but they were all had everything in common. This is two chapters later. We don't know how much time is between chapter 2 and chapter 4. Not a lot. Probably another couple of Sundays. And by the way, more thousands of people are coming to Christ. This is radical. This is different. This is not normal. With any scope of any place on the planet. This is, this is amazing. And then this happens. <laughs> they bring Peter and John and they say, okay. I'm telling you, stop doing what you're doing. And a, a leader in the synagogue raised up. He goes, hey, wait a minute, come on. Let these guys go. There was this one guy. He had about 300 people. He disappeared. Then there was this other guy. He had about 400 followers, and then he disappeared. This, by the way, if this is of God, you're going to be in trouble because it's of God. So why don't you just, it'll just all die. That's what happens before this verse, chapter 5, verse 40. And the, and the rest of the religious leaders go, oh, okay. Yeah, because you're right. If it's of God, we don't want to touch it. And what do they do? <laughs> they bring Peter and John in and they beat them. I don't know what's going to happen to me this afternoon. I have no idea what God has in store for me this afternoon. I'm going to somebody's house for dinner. I'm not expecting to be beaten. Nobody got that in their mind, do they? <laughs> You're not going to throw anything, are you? These guys were beaten. And then look what it says. They left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. This is radical, folks. No one thinks this way. If you're here this morning and you've never been to church before, this is how we started 2,000 years ago. This is how it all started. This is what it's all about. Now the question is, where are we today in regard to our worship? The book of Hebrews is written one generation after that. 
Okay, about 35, 35 years after all this happened, 30 to 35 years. The temple is still up. It's about 62 AD. The temple is going to fall at 65 AD. So the Jewish people who came to Christ, they were actually having to leave the temple to become members of the body of Christ. I know there's a number of people in this audience who have family members who are not saved. And I think there's at least two or three that I know that I've talked to. You are the only person in your family who's a believer. You are probably the only people in this body right now that unless you have that experience, you can't understand what was happening to these people. They literally had to leave. When they said, I believe in Jesus Christ, they were ostracized from their complete family. They were taken away from the synagogue, their community. And remember, the Jewish community is very proud. I'm a Jew was a big deal. They were completely alone. This is why they had to come together and help each other for need. People who had jobs were, were no longer employed. If you said you were a Christian, a, a, a Christ follower of the way is what it was called in the beginning. If you, if you were married, your, your spouse left you because you came to Christ. Their concept of worship completely changed from the temple to worshiping a risen Christ. That's where we're at today. One generation later, look what the writer of Hebrews says. He said, therefore, don't get discouraged, folks. Lift up your hands. I know there's people being thrown in prison because of the, of the fact that they're Christians. Don't let yourself become weak. Stand strong. I know that it's hard. This is this pastor speaking. He looks out over his body and he goes, I know it's hard for you. I know it's hard. I know it's really hard because this is what's been happening because you claim you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And then he goes to the end of chapter 12 where we finished a couple weeks ago. And he said, Here's, this is it. I want you to offer acceptable worship in reverence and awe Go back to chapter 2 of Acts, right? It was in awe then. Go back to know who, we, who we're worshiping because God is a consuming fire. And by the way, we're not doing offerings, right? Do we do offerings? How do we get, how do we get money? How do we get money? Oh, you do that. <laughs> oh, on an app. We got an app for that. Wouldn't that be great? How many of you, how many of you use the app? Isn't that cool? And there's a box in the back, right? Wouldn't that be cool? Uh, Dan, how much is your car worth? Twenty-five thousand. That wasn't a bad deal, Dan. <laughs> just, <laughs> I just realized what I did for you right there. So Dan, Dan's going to go out tomorrow and sell his car for twenty-five thousand. He's going to come up here and drop it in the app. And he's going to say, "Just want y'all to know, I sold my car." 25,000. Problem is, he actually sold a car for 27,000. There's a guy like that in the early church. His name wasn't Dan. His name was Ananias. His wife was Sapphira. Just before in Acts 4, a guy named Barnabas sells a property and comes in and says, hey, I sold the property. We need to use this money for the church. And if you look at the end of chapter 4, this is like a cool thing. So Ananias is sitting back here in the corner. He's like, I'm going to do that. So he goes out and sells some property. And he comes in. He's not in trouble because he sold the property and held some back. He's in trouble, watch, because he lied to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in his worship and said, I sold it for this much, but he didn't. He actually sold it for this much because he had a little bit for himself. And it would have been fine for him to do that. But in his pride, guess what he does? He lies. And immediately, would this not be amazing? No, it would not be. This scares me to death. Um, I earned this much and I gave it all to the church. Ah, uh, no, you didn't. God is a consuming fire. His wife comes in late for church. <laughs> Did you sell it for this much? Yeah. Boom. She falls down dead. I don't know about you, but this is just a crazy story. Remember the story I told you about in the Old Testament where the guy was picking up sticks on the Sabbath and the whole congregation stoned him? That's one of these stories. Do we understand that God is a powerful, awesome God that we should revere? That's what he's trying to say here. So when we talk about worshiping God, 
with an acceptable way in reverence and awe, we better understand what that looks like. So that's how it ended in chapter 12. And in chapter 13 began, and he begins to listen, because you can almost hear people say, well, what does it mean to worship in, in awe, in reverence? What does that look like? And so Pastor Eric and Cameron, last two weeks, have kind of outlined for us what it looks like. One thing it looks like is we're supposed to worship in brotherly love, right? We're supposed to care for people, love them, even though, frankly, I'm a little unlovable. I'm a little prickly. I'm, a, I'm an acquired taste, but you're supposed to love me. I was hoping for like at least one amen in the congregation with that. <laughs> I know you're introverted, my dear, but you could have just said amen right there. We're supposed to love each other, even if we don't like each other. We're supposed to be hospitable to strangers. I probably fit the stranger side more than the other side. We're supposed to remember those who suffer. These are things he's saying. You want to know what it means to worship in awe, in reverence, in fear? This is what it means. You should be able to look at your life, and the Spirit of God is producing these things out of your life. This is what he's saying. We should, we should be pure in our marriage relationships. No, no infidelity. And remember, at that moment in time in the Roman world, that was, that, that was just, just the way it was. We're to be free from loving money. We're, we're supposed to be praising God because he is our help. We'll come back to that later. We're supposed to honor those that Cameron talked about this last week, who, who taught us in the past. We're supposed to praise Christ's immutability. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever. He's always the same. They, they, this is not a new doctrine. This is just church. The church is being built. Finally, we're to avoid false teachings and works, which Cameron talked about last week, and worship only purely by grace. That's what he said so far. So it's nine things. You can have, if, those of you who like check, how many of you like, like check stuff off? Check. Come on, there's some of you are like this. I know some of you, you're, you're like check people, right? You gotta have it, gotta have it on a list. There's your list right there. In fact, I see four of you that were on, as I'm doing this, you're trying, I'm leaving the slide up just so you can write them down because I saw you writing them, okay? Because that's what you want. Hey, believe me, checks are great. We should check boxes. It's a little bit deeper than that, and we're going to see in just a moment. Watch where he's going to go next, though. He's going to go from here to another part, and he's going to give us four more, and then I think he's going to end with a fifth one. Okay, so I'm going to do four now, four more, so that'll be nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and he's going to give us number 14 next week. We'll dive into that. That's what he's saying. So here's the passage we're going to look at today. Wow, that was a long introduction. Don't worry, I will get done today, sometime. Here's what he says. Therefore, as a result of all of this, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. That's going to be our first point. Our second point is here. For where we have no lasting city, but we seek a city that is to come. What does that mean? That's apparently part of our worship in awe, whatever that means. Through him, then... Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. It's a big deal right here for him to say that. Acknowledge his name. The best way I could do this is for you to put a shirt on tomorrow when you go to work and say, I'm acknowledging the name of Jesus. And I dare you to put under the bottom of that, that's what matters. Huh, that'll get you in a world of hurt, don't you think? I'm not trying to be insensitive, I'm trying to be pointed. That's exactly what that word is when we look at it here in just a minute. How, how much are we willing to acknowledge the name with the fruit of our lips? That's what he's talking about. And then the last one is this, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are nominal with God, such sacrifices are missed by God. No. Such sacrifices are not necessary in your walk with God. No. Such sacrifices please God. That's powerful. I don't know about you, but I, that just makes me wake up real quick. 
So let's take a look at these. We'll break each one of them down. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each one because I think the, the context of the verse pretty much cares. That I don't need to mess up what the author's already done here. But let's just kind of break them down just a little bit, all right? We'll take a look at the first one right here. Let us go outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. Cameron? Yes, sir. Last week you said, you talked about two goats. How many people remember that? You said... I'm going to talk about it a little bit, and then David's going to talk about it next week. I, I, have, yeah, I have it on tape that you said that. Yes, okay, I had no plan to do that. <laughs> so I appreciate that you teed this up so well for me, because I'm not even going to talk about the goats very much. What do you mean the goat? I have to talk about one goat. Okay. All right. So you get that. Okay, if you're new to Christianity, and especially to the Old Testament, this goat thing has got to mess you all up, Okay. But in a day of atonement, Yom Kippur, then they would bring in a goat, and one goat the, the priest would put their hands on, and that goat would be the goat that got that, the, the sins of the people, and the other goat would be sacrificed. That goat would be sent out to Azazel. Now, Azazel, we don't have a lot of understanding. That was the name of the goat, Azazel, which means scapegoat. The goat would go out into the wilderness, and, and um, Cameron, I think you hit it, a home run with that exactly right. That, that Imagine what the people would have thought on that day when they watched their sins represented by this goat walking into the wilderness. The wilderness to the Jewish people was bad. It was just a bad place. It was a place of doom. It was a place of gloom. It was a place of death. So the sins of the people would be going off to this place of death. Imagine it. And I love what you said about that. It gave me great encouragement myself. How this author is using this is not necessarily in the same technical way. What he wants us to understand is this. And I, I think if you let me make this connection, I'll show you why I'm putting this point up here. Our acceptable worship, if it is done in reverence and awe, is going to be marvelously different in how we think about worship how we think about our relationship to life. It is completely different. He says that he went outside the camp. What he's trying to say to us is the old is all gone now. It is done. It is gone. It is over. Christ went outside the camp. He went outside Jerusalem to be crucified, right? Golgotha was outside. Do you realize Jesus was born outside the city? He was born in a little town called Bethlehem. He lived outside the city. He lived in Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth, one of the disciples said. Here's a, we're, we worship Jesus Christ who is outside the mainstream of everything. To the Jewish people, however, this outside the camp, if you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you would be put outside everything. Again, I know there's some people here who are outside their family because they've chosen to believe Jesus Christ. They get what, what this text says. You and I, and bless, tell you what, I, I, I would love everybody in my family to know Christ, and when we got together, it was just a great worship service. I would, that's just a, those of you who get to do that, you get to do that this afternoon, you bow your head and you just praise God that everybody in your family is related that way because that is not how it is, was not how it was for these people. And it is not how it is for most people. There's an ostracization. I say that? Ostracization. Aaron said I could say it that way. Okay. Outside the camp. Think about this piece that we, we have decided because we're coming to Christ, we're putting away everything from the past. Was your salvation that revolutionary in your mind? That your mindset began to look at it different. Those of you who are in business, I'm in business. I compete all the time with people in business. I'm always trying to be a little bit better than my competitor. Seldom does that ever happen, but I'm trying. We're trying to separate, but at the same time, we do best practices and we do the same thing. Do you realize what he's trying to say here in their minds? When they left Judaism... They began to live completely different. It had nothing to do with the trappings of the past. What would happen if we ran our businesses that way? If we said, we're not going to do what our MBA teaches us. Instead, we're going to do it based on a biblical mindset. That would be living outside the camp. What if tomorrow you decided to go to work and you were radically different? That would be living outside the camp. 
I was going to start the service, but I realized I wouldn't have enough time because I'm not even going to get all these points finished, to have you stand up and talk to each other about where you work and what the temperature is in regards to Jesus Christ. I was actually going to have you do that. So just do it in your head real quick. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 meaning you could talk Christ and come in and sing those songs we sang this morning. That's how wonderful the place is you work for Jesus Christ. One is, you better not even say Jesus Christ in a worshipful way. Where do you work? Where do you live? What does it look like in your school? What does it look like in your community? That's what's happening here. When he said Jesus went outside, go, therefore let's go to him outside the camp, he's saying it's radically different. Our worship is completed. Don't think of worship right here. Think of worship when you walk out this door. Do we drive radically different? Oh, that was a low shot because I'm terrible at driving. Do we, do we purchase radically different? That's what he's trying to get at. Bear the reproach that he bore. He, it says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, run with endurance the race that's set before us and looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who what? For the shame that was set before him endured the cross. He endured. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to bear that, uh, that shame. I think one of the major things you and I have to wrap our mind around to think differently is this concept of suffering. If you look at the early church, that's, that was, they were bathed in it. But I love this last part. How are we supposed to do this? Go to him. This makes us radically different. We're no different than any other church if we're trying to do this on our own. But the fact that we go to Christ, amen, that's how that happens. That's how we're supposed to be radically different. Are you radically different in your day-to-day -day worship? I'm not talking about the worship we just did where Jake and the band just, and they're going to come up at the end and sing something glorious for us and we're going to all say, that, that's great worship, love it, let's keep doing that. I'm talking about tomorrow in the grocery store line when somebody cuts you off on the cart. I'm actually channeling if they cut me off on an exit ramp, but you get my point. <laughs> Think about this. Are we this different that the world looks at us and almost despises us for the fact of our righteousness that have been given to us by Jesus Christ. That's what was happening in the early church. Go to him. This is a little bit like Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, by the mercies of God, what? Present your bodies as what? Living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and be not what? Conform to this world, but be what? Transform where? In your mind. I believe what he's trying to get at us here in this whole chapter 13 is I want you to be radically different, church. I want you to look completely different than the world, and if you do, it's going to be completely different in the way you think about worship and how you think about your life. The minute they came to Christ, everything changed for them. Nothing was the same. They didn't try to blend. They tried to be distinctively unique, different. Number two, we have no lasting city but we seek a city that is to come. Now, he talked to us about this already a little bit. This, this has to do with our motivation. We are not motivated in our worship for tangible things because the new has come to us. And it's not tangible, it's eternal. We're not supposed to look for something that's lasting. Instead, you and I are supposed to be seeking a city that is eternal, that is different. So in chapter 11, we saw this that said Abraham and the, and the fathers that were before us, they, they were looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. They weren't looking for something tangible. They weren't trying to acquire wealth. They weren't trying to acquire things. This is why he just said, don't love money. It's just, it, what are you seeking in your life? What am I seeking? That's what he's trying to say here. And he goes on to 25 through 26 and talks a little bit about Moses who didn't look at the the, the Egyptian world, and he said, I want something better. I want the riches of Christ. That's what he's challenging us here. Um, I love the passage of 12, 22, and 24. You remember this that we talked about already? Um, this side here is tangible. Notice that touch it, the, 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 the senses that are involved right here, okay? That's what the Old Testament was. That's what this group was leaving. Notice what they're coming to. He says, you have come to Mount Zion. And he goes, and to a city of the living God, the heavenly Jer Jerusalem. Would that not be enough? 
and to innumerable angels in festive gathering. Would that not be enough? And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Those are three great things. And, he says, to, to the God, the judge of all. Would that not be great? That's four things. And then he says, and, and to the spirit of the righteous made perfect. That's five things. Is that not cool? And, hold on, we're not done. This is like, this is like if you bought this and they said, and this and this and this. And this. Wait a minute, you get one more thing on this. The media, to Jesus, the meteor of a better covenant. Yes, that's what we've come to. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. And the sprinkled blood, which speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted just saying all that. Much less get to receive all that by faith in Jesus Christ. You and I are looking for something more eternal, not temporal. You know what bogs us down? The temporal. I'm doing a talk on, you'll love this. I'm doing a talk in New York in a couple weeks on self-care. <laughs> Can you think bubble bath and whatever you do for self-care? And I read a big article on it today, this morning, just get, get my mind going from an author I would never, re, never read and never quote and not believe. <laughs> but it shocked me about this concept of self-care. Do you realize, as believers, we have the best self-care process in the whole entire world? We give our lives to Jesus Christ. It is such a wonderful thing. And that's what he's trying to say here, okay? Number three, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice. So this one right here is our focus is completely different in regard to it. Not only are we motivated differently, not only is our mind thinking differently, but we have a complete focus. Who is the focus on in this right here? In that verse, who are we focusing on? Who are we not focusing on? Ha, ha, ha. I don't know about you, but that kind of blows Church Growth 101 marketing all, all the smithereens. I remember back in the 80s, um, I was, got out of college, and I went to a church in Florida, and I went to a conference, and they were talking about um, church demographics and analytics. This was like pre-90s. I didn't even know how to spell those words. I had no idea what that meant, and they were talking about how to market your church. I went, oh, wow, I don't even know how to market a church. What does that look like? And how to create a service that is appealing to the world. And I don't have any problem with all that stuff, by the way. I'm not trying to say, I'm just like brain dead when it comes to me. I didn't know you're supposed to do all that stuff. How did I know that was going to happen, that that's what you're supposed to do? Well, actually, <laughs> guess what this service is supposed to be about? It's supposed to be about whether or not you're comfortable. You all feeling comfortable? Put your feet. Well, if it's comfortable, you'd have better chairs, don't you think? Yeah. And I'd probably get you a pop. Anything else you want? Popcorn. Oh, nice, yeah. Sold old sold in Mississippi, but that's all right. That's another story. What that you don't even know what I I don't even know why I said that. Keep going. Are you comfortable? Or do we not approach that worship sometime that way? Worship is not about our comfort, is it? Look what this what the passage says. It, he gives four things. It should be continually. Not, not, okay, I got like seven minutes. I'll get done. Don't worry. You're, you're good. I got seven minutes to finish this up. We're cool. I only have 42 more slides. Are you comfortable? It's supposed to be continual. It'll keep going. As you leave, it's gonna, you're going to be worshiping. As you, go to, as you go to work tomorrow, you're going to be worshiping. I wish I had all of you wake me up in the morning with a singing you just did. Would that not be awesome? I could just carry all of you around. And I go to work, and I'm ready to talk, and you're over here singing the whole time. Would that not be just awesome? Probably a little distracting for the audience, but I'd love it. Think about that. It is supposed to be sacrificially done. It's not supposed to be something that I'm coming to get. My worship on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is for me to sacrificially do something that, that, that contributes to the praise and glory of Jesus Christ. That's what worship is. It's not about what I get. We're in a market world. Believe me, everything we see on TV, everything we see in a, in a billboard, every advertisement we have is keyed to make sure you don't miss out and I don't miss out on something in life. The world system is so drunk with self-absorption. Absorption. Still good? Thank you. Okay. I don't know why I'm having you do that today, but you're, thank you very much. It's, this is cool. Look at this. It's supposed to be verbally. The fruit of the lips... Proverbs teaches us that what comes up in the, how do I say it in my, my web page? What's in the well comes up in the bucket. 
What's ever in here comes out in there. This is the first thing I say to every place I go speak. I give them my life laws, and my first life law is what's in the well comes up in the bucket. And I always do this illustration. If I go out in the hall, and you bump into me, Haley, and you bump me really hard, whatever's in here is going to come out like this, so you know. Okay? And if it's not good, you know why it comes out that way? Because it's not good right here. And I'm here today to talk to you. That's what my opening line is most of the time. Okay? What's in here? Folks, what's in here? We are supposed to give praise of the fruit. The, the word fruit there is just, we don't have time to study it. Take your own time and go study the word fruit there. It's just amazing. We're supposed to have fruit coming off our life. And I think I immediately go the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. It's not that I didn't know them. I wanted you guys to participate, okay? Notice this piece right here. Humbly to acknowledge his name. How do we do this? Through him. We'll come back to this one in just a minute because I'm going to close with that thought. Last one. Do not neglect to do good and to share. That's the Greek word koinia. Share what you have. For such sacrifices please God. We are to give completely differently. If you're caught in the moment in your mind, do I give 10% of my gross or my net? You have completely missed koinia, history of the church, giving. The majority of the New Testament books were written about getting money coming in to the people who were impoverished. They have a theme in almost every one of them about people who were poor within the Christian community. What does that look like? This is a big deal. It's others, not me. It's him, not me. It's others, not me. We're to do good and to share. Uh, how are we doing with the pastor coming from Cuba? Very well. Very well. What else does he need? A car, Dan. <laughs> Think about this. This is real life. It's the body of Christ. He's coming from Cuba. Do you imagine getting seminary and going back to Cuba? He could be the one person who changes that entire country for Jesus Christ. Folks, we are part of a body that is intended for that purpose. I don't have time to do this. I love Hebrews 6.10. For God is not unjust to overlook the love you have shown for the saints, for him, for his name, and for the saints, as you still do. I love that little play, as you still do. He got a preacher up there wailing out. This guy's wailing out. And he goes, but I do recognize that you're doing this. I do recognize that you're doing this. I do recognize you're doing it. Just keep doing it. That's what he's trying to say here. He says in chapter 10, verse 32, 34, I know you took meals to people who were in prison. Remember, people who got thrown in prison, they didn't get fed. The only way they got that fed is if their friends and family came to feed them. If you came to feed them, you would be saying, acknowledging, I am a believer of Christ myself. So I'm going to prison to feed my friend who's there because they believe in Christ. I just want you to know I do too. Ha! Huh! That's a little strange thinking. Sacrifice that pleases God. We can please a lot of people in this world. I know a lot of you probably suffer from the uh, complex of people pleasing. You have a desire in your heart to make people happy. Bless your hearts. We love every one of you. <laughs> I don't fit that category very much. <laughs> My wife does. Thank you, dear. Because she always, she always wants to make me, make me be happy. I'm not very good at that kind of thing. You know what we all should be good at, though? Pleasing God in our acts of service to others. Notice what he says, what some other authors say, just to close. Notice what he says to the rich, what Paul says to the rich. I love that last part in blue. So that they may take hold of that, which is what? Truly life. Truly life. I don't know what your life looks like, but is that not just a great passage right there? I want a real true life. I want a life that really means something and, and, and it, it does something for Jesus Christ and it pleases God. Um, <clears throat> I love this. I think, uh, I think I prayed this over uh, Beth and Jerry's family. Beth sent this to me. Uh, I love this, this verse right here. I love the last part. By his power, by whose power? His power, he may fulfill every purpose, every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. 
Pray that over me. Pray that over people. That's an amazing verse to pray over people right there. I love what Micah says. and I don't have time to develop the whole book of Micah here in this last couple minutes because I'm taking something right out of him. Huge, huge message for him. But what does God require? Justice and mercy shown to other people. We ought to be the beaming light of justice and mercy. So when you hear the concept about justice in any context, understand that you and I are to be the light bearers of showing justice and mercy. Is that not wonderful? That's a radical different way. So my big idea, I'm still developing this <laughs> for chapter 12 and chapter 13. I believe that God wants us to run with endurance and he's weaving suffering into our lives as a design for the sole purpose of spurring us on to worshiping him in reverence of awe through how we interact with our fellow believers in Jesus Christ. That's a radical church. That's a radical church. How do we do all that? He give, he's given us a clue here. First of all, verse 6. How do I do this, God? How do I do this? Psalm 118. Hey, haven't I told you? I am there. I am with you. He said it to Moses. He said it to Noah. He said it to Joshua. He said, you look up how many times he said those kind of words to one of the people of the, of the, God, of the book of faith in chapter 11. God is here to help us do that. How is he going to do it? Christ, the same today, yesterday, forever. How is he going to do it? To him, through him, with him, by him, in grace. You cannot leave here and do this on your own. I cannot do this on my own. I tried that for years in a legalistic world. It is by God's grace that you and I are empowered to do this. So that's the characteristics of the early church, completely radical. As the band comes forward, I just want to ask this question right here. What does the church look like 2,000 years later? If 2,000 years from now, if the Lord were to tarry and not come back for another 2,000 years, and they found a document that was posted online about Bridge Bible Church, can you imagine 2,000 years from now? An antiquated thing on a computer that they probably won't have in 2,000 years. And they read about this congregation. And they read the following. A pastor coming from Cuba needed a car. And Dan gave him his Travis. Travis? Traverse. Traverse. That would be radical, wouldn't it? Do you realize we're reading a document right now by a guy named Ananias and Sapphira? He never came to church that day thinking his name was going to be public, although he wanted it to be, and it was. Acceptable worship in reverence and awe. That's what he wants to get from us. Stand with me. I highlighted the key word in this benediction that he's going to go. We only got three more messages on this whole thing. This is depressing. Three more messages on the whole book, all right? This one's in two weeks. We're going to go back over this passage in two weeks. I can't wait. Say it with me together, please. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. How? Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, Jesus changed everything in one weekend. So let's sing to that this morning. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb 
till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew Jesus when I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day rescue my sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healing your love help is the air that i'm breathing the future my eyes were hoping Cause when you call my name Well, thank you guys for coming out this morning and worshiping our Lord and Savior. It is a glorious day when we get to see him. So go in his presence and have a wonderful week.